so we can get started. Um, like I said, Mayor Polly's going to join us in a little bit, but we can go through introductions to, to get started. So it's really nice to see a lot of familiar faces um, here tonight and some new ones. Uh, my name is Autumn Monahan. I'm the assistant to the city administrator. And my role at the city includes um, communications and our neighborhood engagement program. So when we first launched this program several years ago, uh, we quickly realized there are some key community members um, who serve, whether officially or not officially, as champions for their neighborhoods. And all of you definitely know your neighbors best and what the issues are important to them. So we find these meetings super helpful. And in our last meeting, we talked a lot about the value of networking of neighborhood leaders talking with each other. So that's what we hope to do a bit tonight. Um, so before we uh, go around into introductions of everybody, just reviewing a few logistics because we're in uh, WebEx as our meeting platform tonight. So please, uh, you're welcome and encouraged to turn video on just so we all can see each other. Um, as you can see, I'm a little starved for some kind of interaction. So it's wonderful to see you all. So turn on your um, video if you feel comfortable. Um, and the video button is right next to your mute button at the bottom of your screen. And uh, if someone's not on video, you'll still see their names, um, sometimes their initials. On the right side of your screen, you'll see the list of participants along with an option to raise your virtual hand. So please raise your hand if you've got a comment or want to speak. Uh, we also have enabled the chat feature. So please go ahead and chat throughout the meeting too. And we'll make sure that we can address any questions or if you want to uh, talk. If you have joined us by phone, I see that there's two people who have joined us by phone. Um, you will not be able to unmute yourself, but you can press star three to raise your hand and then we'll know to call on you and you can uh, then speak. And then finally, as a heads up tonight, we are recording the meeting so we can share it with those who were not able to join us tonight. Um, so with that, um, let's see. So um, first, I'd also like to introduce uh, Thomas Rush. He's our communications coordinator and um, a third of our mighty communications team. It is me, Thomas, and Tim Smith, who does our video. Um, and so uh, Thomas is here tonight. And, uh, we both work on every aspect of communication in the city. And so um, he is also a great resource for you and will be helping me in just logistics tonight with the meeting. So um, next we wanna hear from each of you. So when I call out your name, please unmute yourself, um, share what neighborhood you're from, and let's share one of our favorite stories or memories of our neighborhood. And so I'll go first. I am an Issaquah resident and I live on Squawk Mountain. And uh, after I created this question, I had to think for a second of my favorite name, memory of my neighborhood. Um, my daughters uh, every year host a lemonade stand. And the first year that we did it, it turned into a six hour party on our block. And so I just love seeing everyone come out of their homes and just hang out together in our street. And it was just that moment I realized that this was definitely home for us and our family. So um, that was definitely a great moment for us um, here on Squawk. So, um, next, I will, I'm just going to go right on the top of our screen. So next is Connie. Okay, well, I live, I also live on Squawk, but, um, you know, I'm more of a city-wide Issaquah person rather than just my neighborhood person. So I'm... Uh, it's a little awkward just to limit myself to Squawk Mountain, which is enormous and has many sides. So I'm going to go to what I like about my neighborhood, which is we have no rules. We can use blue tarps. We can have a rotting car in our yard and no one in particular cares or complains. And we don't have neighborhood dinners together, but anytime any of us needs a tool or help, then everybody volunteers or knows somebody who can help us. And and I sort of like that hermit, anti-hermit part about Squawk Mountain. Thanks, Connie. Uh, next is Elisa. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Elisa Taggart. I'm from Regency Centers. Hi, everybody. See some familiar faces and some new faces, faces I've talked to on the phone. I'm actually kind of a fly on the wall at this point. Uh, some of you who know me, I'm actually based in Los Angeles, but Grand Ridge Plaza is my baby. She sits in uh, Issaquah Highlands, 330,000 square feet of her. 
Um, I will just share my favorite memory, which is unfortunately my only memory of Issaquah right now was my first visit last year. Um, there was a kind of a running joke because as you would probably imagine being born and raised in LA, I was head to toe in winter gear. Meanwhile, everybody else was in like a lightweight jacket and or a sweatshirt and throughout the day, everybody kept asking me if I had a cold or something like that. So, um, that, that was my favorite memory. I think because of this past year, unfortunately, I haven't made any return visits, but I'm looking forward to coming back up there and meeting some more of you guys um, in the foreseeable future, especially in person. So thank you. Great, thank you. Thanks for joining us. Uh, next is Christy. <clears throat> Good evening, everyone. I'm Christy Garrard. I'm the executive director for Issaquah Highlands Council. And I also live in Issaquah Highlands since 2007, and uh, we love it here, and we love the beauty of our community and how well it's maintained and the great commercial options at Grand Ridge Plaza. Um, at uh, my job at Highlands Council, we oversee social programming and official communications for one third of the population of the city of Issaquah. So uh, being up to date on COVID issues and all things city related so that we can help get that message out in support of Autumn and Thomas's efforts are really important to us. I also produce the annual Highlands Day Festival every year and I have done that since 2007. And it is my favorite memory of our community when 5,000 people from the uh, greater east side come to Isqua Highlands and get to see what it's like to live in community and just seeing all of our Friends, we have over 100 uh, community volunteers. 50% of those are under the age of 18. Um, watching kids grow up in this community and go from enjoying the, the kitty rides to serving in uh, volunteer roles is just really fulfilling for me. So glad to be here tonight. Nice to see everyone. Thanks, Christy. Next is Hart. Oh, Hart, sorry. There you go. Good evening, I'm Hart Sugarman, and I'm uh, living in Summerhill neighborhood. And I'm also one of the board members of our HOA. And uh, I've lived here now for 25 years. And the best part of living here was when our kids were young and all the next door neighbors for a number of consecutive homes all had children in the same age group. And the kids played in the backyard and there's no fences between the homes. We were able to go through all these consecutive homes and just play safely in the in the in the neighborhood but Issaquah is a great city um, and uh, our family loves being here thanks heart let's see next colleen hi i'm colleen uh i've been in Issaquah for about four years and i live in the woods slash morgan's ridge neighborhood at the very bottom of squawk mountain um, so we are like more the social part of Squawk Mountain, um, but I sit on the activities uh, on our HOA board. Um, and my favorite memory, I think, has been the last couple months where I have two toddlers and our neighborhood went all out with the Halloween decorations and the Christmas decorations. So there's lots of blow ups on our front lawn, um, everyone's front lawns. And so taking my kids on walks through our neighborhood. Um, they just loved the Olaf and loved the the Rudolph and stuff. So I, I appreciate the whole neighborhood going all out this year. Awesome. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, Kay. So, um, yes, I live in, um, they call, we call our neighborhood association Terra Highlands, which is a little deceptive. It's actually on Pinecone Drive off of Newport. Uh, near anthology and um, we have an absolutely wonderful community and I know I think I'd have to put my best memories in two categories one of course is around the participation of people in issues that really count for our neighborhood uh, one including of course the, the Bergsman development um, that was a, a wonderful showing from our community and the broader community which uh, I, we developed deeper friendships of knowing each other, participating in something that was really important to us. Um, so that's one thing. And then on the other side, we just have a really warm, welcoming committee, or a community. It's, it's very diverse. We have in normal years, non-COVID years, we have you know an annual barbecue and picnic out in the cul-de-sac, uh, you know, ladies' night out, uh, different things that uh, groups of neighbors, especially the ladies, do together. 
Um, and there's just, yeah, there's a really nice connection in our neighborhood. There's really a warm feeling. You know, we're just about the right size. We're less than 40 homes. So it's a smaller enclave of people, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a wonderful place to live. It really is. Thanks, Kay. Um, Joe, Werner, did you want to say anything? It looks like you've got a um, limited connection. He may not be able to. All right, let's move on. Um, how about Sherry? Did you say Sherry, Autumn? Yes. Oh, sorry. Oh, no worries. <laughs> Hi, I'm Sherry Smith. I live in the woods with Colleen, not in her house, but in the woods. <laughs> yeah. And they do a great job with activities d throughout the year. I say they because, um, yeah. All aside from me, that's for sure. But um, I do enjoy being so close to everything that um, I have a, a disabled daughter who can walk everywhere. So, um, and she does all the way from the woods to Fred Myers. So I, I do get concerned with maybe some of the people she might meet along the way. Um, but otherwise I love the, the neighborhood. It's great. Thanks. All right, um, how about Sarah? There we go. Can you hear me? Yeah. Hi, um, I'm Sarah. I'm the executive director for the Ithaca Highlands Community Association. So the HOA for Ithaca Highlands work closely with Kirsty and with Alyssa. Um, and um, I would have to say uh, the biggest thing for me recently, I actually, I, I don't live in the Highlands. I live in Fall City. But with the big power outage we just had the other day, all of our neighbors were like amazing. They all came out, they made sure everybody was okay. We were moving um, branches everywhere. People started running extension cords, whoever had um, uh, generators. We were out for two and a half days. So we combined food and all sorts of stuff. It was just, it was really great. I, I just felt like I was really in the right place. But um, for the Ithaca Highlands, for the um, past winter, obviously we really had to think outside the box for COVID. And we, um, uh, uh, Regency Centers and myself put together just quickly <laughs> um, a, a bunch of stuff for the holidays. So we did letters to Santa and, and we got a bunch of charities involved and um, we did the Santa Cruz, which was amazing. The, the, the smile on the kids' faces was worth any little bit of headache we had um and, and it just was just like you could just see it on their faces they were just desperate for some you know for everyone to come together for the holiday so that those that's my favorite memory so. thank you i i may admit that uh we took our our girls up in our minivan and just parked somewhere in the highlands so they could wave cool. to santa <laughs> <laughs> good. Yes. Yeah. I mean, it was our first attempt, so you know it, it was great. It didn't go wrong, but you know, everyone just needed just a little like, okay, let's just take a deep breath this year. So yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I thought that was a great idea. Thank um, you. All right, Susan. Hi, Susan. Hello. Hello. Hi. I'm Kate Haynes' neighbor, and I live on the side of Cougar Mountain, also. And I've been like 26 years, I think, in the same neighborhood. And about half of the people have been there just as long as I have. <laughs> it's, it's, it's wonderful. Um, many, many memories. What I really like is when it snows and the kids come out and, the, and all the adults come out and we all act like kids and all the dogs. <laughs> and we just spend the, you know, the days when it's here playing. And <clears throat> we are a very close community. And we can't have rusted cars like Connie, but <laughs> everybody shares everything. <laughs> you know, ladders and snow blowers and whatever it is. Um, so you would always know you can count on a neighbor for something. You're never alone. Yeah. Thank you. Perfect. Thanks. Uh, Christina. Christina, can you hear us? 
Hmm, maybe we'll move on. How about John? Hmm. Okay, let's try one more. How about Mary? This is Mary, but I'm not sure what we're doing. I didn't get the uh, Welcome, Mary. Now, so I'm not, I, I'm just getting on. So let's move on. <laughs> okay. Well, welcome, Mary. We're just introducing ourselves and what neighborhood we live in and what we like about our neighborhood. Okay. I'm Mary yeah. Lynch, and I live just off of Newport Way in Summerhill. Thanks for being here, Mary. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And uh, Rich. Hmm, also maybe not able to unmute. All right, and we have two people joining us via phone. The first is a 206 number with the last numbers of 91. I believe that's Christina. Oh, is she's on the phone. <laughs> I see. Hi, Christina. <laughs> Welcome. Can you hear me now, Adam? Yeah, hi, Rich. Hey. Uh, yeah, Rich Loudon, uh, Overdale Association, and uh, I'm the president of the HOA. And what, mainly what we do is we manage our four-acre park and our monuments and provide connection to our 160 homes and uh, just stay connected with the city and Mary Lou and, and, the, and the police folks uh, for security and things like that. Um, but generally, uh, we manage the park and we provide social connections and parties and things like that. I think my favorite thing about living here is we are just a walk from everything up on the Highlands and everything down uh, in Issaquah with uh, all the wonderful trails and everything. So it's just the location is so central. Mm -hmm. um, if you're not, if you're willing to get some cardio and climb a few hills, you can uh, you can get around just on your feet. Thanks, Rich. And Mayor Polly. Hello, thanks for joining us. We've just finished introductions. I think you might know most people on the call, uh, but we have pretty good representation tonight from many neighborhoods. Yeah, thank you, Autumn. So 9-1 is Christina, and who is 7-5 then on the call? Not sure. Not sure. I'll just see if okay. they'll unmute themselves. That's okay. I'm okay. Curious. So I'm um, kind of looking at... Uh, the notes that you had prepared for me. So we, you're all the way down to introductions and you would now be handing it over to me where I would be. <laughs> yes. Okay. Uh, yes, but uh, we, we um, Councilor Ray has not joined quite yet. Okay. Um, so I think, you know, actually as before we started, even our formal meeting, we were talking vaccinations. So um, oh. it's, uh, let's go through, I'll um, share my screen and we can go through um, the city's response to COVID, kind of the plan and focus for the next mm -hmm. 90 days, a bit about our work plan. And then we were gonna spend the rest of our time as a group today, uh, just networking and sharing ideas for how we can stay connected uh, in quarantine. So uh, let me make great. sure I can share my screen. So I'm gonna apologize first. Uh, sorry that I am late. We had like a last minute meeting pop up and city administrator Bob Kowitz is still at that meeting. So he may be joining us, but it might not be for a little bit. And if I do see any council members pop on, I'll make sure to give them a moment to introduce themselves. But I believe most people in this group would probably uh, are already familiar with council president, deputy council president Ray and, and council member Goodman. Okay, so, um, and then we have Autumn and we have Thomas and now on to COVID-19 the subject of the year. So um, it's been very interesting, 2020 and now into 2021, where the city is still in um, uh, response mode, not a recovery mode. And I feel like we're gonna be hanging around there until we get through the vaccination component of this. Um, we've had pretty great cooperation from the neighborhoods and around the community, meaning when COVID first came last spring, we received a lot of calls and complaints and um, so did the state office, some calls and complaints about people not understanding, but it does seem like people are um, following for the most part, 
the governor's rules on distancing and masks and all that, that is great. So this big next step that we're going to take on vaccinations has caused a lot of confusion in the community. So I'll tell you a little bit about what we've been doing with that. Um, we put together, uh, the city put together a vac community vaccination collaboration. We realized that um, with limited supply and uh, because we are not a health department, both the um, state level health department and the county level health department would be doing most of the managing. And I'm going to ask if everybody's on mute right now. If, if you could put yourself on mute, that would help to hear a little bit of feedback. So we put together this this is our community vaccination because we, uh, team because we wanted to be ready for when the supply comes. So the folks that are on our team, uh, City of Issaquah, City of Sammamish, Eastside Fire and Rescue, Issaquah School District, Costco, and the Greater Issaquah Chamber of Commerce. And our hope is that we'll be able to do two things. First off, that Eastside Fire and Rescue will be able to secure a vaccine supply where they will be able to do mobile vaccinations, similar to what's happening with Seattle Fire. Each agency had to get its own approval through King County Health, and I believe EFER has passed that bar, and the issue now is just getting vaccine. Um, if, if the scheduling that of deliveries are pulled out to be true, in two to three weeks, we may have mobile crews that will be at least one mobile uh, crew that will be able to give vaccinations and then I proposed the council and the city of Sammamish that we pay for a second um, mobile crew for EFER. Um, we're expecting at some point in time that the federal government will give us some additional funding and this would be a reimbursable item, but it doesn't really matter because we got to do it. <laughs> so even if the costs never get covered, we want to have these two mobile units. Um, we have our Senior center staff and our parks and community service staff working with senior organizations throughout the city, gathering names. And, um, okay, got a little distracted by a chat note. Um, and so we want to make sure that uh, at, we get as large an inventory of um, qualified by phase seniors that we can. Um, know that we know how to contact them, but we're also going to need the community's help to identify as well. I've had several individuals just reach out to me um, by myself and ask if I can help them um, get on a list, but we're going to have to work on that. I saw also an email from Connie today about that. Sorry, guys, I'm just trying to get the chat to disappear and it doesn't seem to want to do it. There we go. Um, and then the second thing is we want to be ready to hit the ground running from an operational point of view when additional vaccine supplies up on a larger scale. So Swedish Hospital has been um, talking with us on Mondays about our ability to pull together a team. And this is what the team would look like. Swedish Hospital would have a scheduling system. So the reservations would be made through them. They also have the ability to collect a volunteer information um, for the people that would staff it. So those are two uh, big pieces that need to happen, and they already have tools to do that. Issaquah School District has volunteered Issaquah High School. Um, they are currently, there's some activity at Issaquah Middle School, but that's really setting up vaccinations for teachers for a return to school. So I'm hearing a little confusion about maybe it's opening sooner because there's activity at Issaquah Middle School, but that's not, uh, that's uh, more for the teachers for return to school. And then we are going to need to call out to our service groups and our community at large for a significant number of volunteers over a significant period of time. When we walked through the numbers with um, Chris at Swedish, he's talking about a six month long vaccination center. That is um, a lot of volunteers, a lot of hours. And we're going to have to go into that with our heads up and realize that it's going to be hard work and it's going to be hard work over a long period of time. But this really is the biggest lift that we can do to make a difference in what's been happening. Um, so Autumn has also given me some resources in my notes. Um, let's just make sure everybody in our community over the age of 65 now knows that they're eligible. And then people who are 50 or older and living in multi-generational households are also eligible to, to get vaccinated now if they meet certain conditions. Um, 
you can go to issaquah.gov slash vaccine to learn about how to schedule an appointment. But as I said earlier, um, it's not really that right now. It's that most places don't have the doses to be able to service all of the people who fit into phase one. Um, so we're trying to uh, get some information out as best we can. It's been really hard because um, we just don't have a lot to share and the anxiety level is so, so high. I've been asked multiple times if people can just make an appointment in September because it would make their, you know, set their mind at ease. But the reality is um, we want to be able to set appointments that we know that we can realistically make and not start up a system where we give everybody an appointment and then we pull everything forward or push everything back. So, but that's, that's causing a lot of anxiety. Providence Point in particular, I don't know if they have a community member on here tonight, but I do hear a lot from Providence Point residents. There are some larger senior living facilities that have been able to have a contract uh, with a provider and get vaccinated, but um, Providence Point, which is 11, 1200 housing units, um, doesn't qualify to fit into that category. And so, um, and Autumn, do we have anybody here from Providence Point? Okay, maybe that's something we wanna work on as well because um, uh, they've been contacting me quite a bit about it. Um, so uh, on, I'm trying to get my days correct here. On Tuesday, yesterday, <laughs> council had a study session where I provided a, uh, uh, actually, sorry, where my staff provided on my behalf a list of things that we needed to work on. And another one of those things is shelter assistance. Um, at this time, the, there's an eviction moratorium in place until the end of March, but there's also needs within our community itself for um, um, emergency housing. And Issaquah Food and Clothing Bank has recently brought on a homeless outreach coordinator um, which is much needed position and some funding is coming from the city of Issaquah for that, as well as council approved some additional uh, staff resources within the city as well. So we have increased our human services staff theoretically. Um, we don't have the bodies on board yet, but the approval is there and we're in the process of hiring and we know that um, this will be a big focus for us this year. So I have asked the council to consider um, providing some extra funding in particular, I think it's seventy five thousand um, dollars for to be used in a in a manner of different ways to help those that are unsheltered now. It may be connecting them with one of their family members. It may be helping them get into a, a hotel voucher for a few nights. Um, lots of different ideas. There were a lot of questions from council last night, so we have uh, um, some things still to figure out. The other is uh, businesses. You know, the city government um, uh, is most effective when we have a well-functioning economy and the business community is just a huge part of that economy. This has been a really difficult year um, at any level of government, whether it's county, state, or local. A big drop in revenues means we all cut services at a time when you need services most, and it's because we rely heavily on sales tax and B and O tax and other things like that. So the council has been investing in the business community, providing grants for a series of different things. Um, some are just business grants. Some were grants for them to be able to rent outdoor shelters, to continue to be able to have outdoor service for restaurants, and I can't remember the full category, but there are three or four different categories of business grants. And I've asked the council to continue that. Um, again, if federal funds come through, that's all reimbursable. But um, we are, we have a significant number of wonderful small one-off businesses. And this is really, really, really difficult time. So some have already closed the doors and some are on a lifeline. And so my message to the community is uh, shop local and uh, let's try the, try the best we can do to help those small businesses in town. And then I'm also trying to invest more in business grants. So another piece of the plan that I presented last night was um, I heard a lot from the community and from some boards and commissions about how people's lifestyles have changed in particular since there isn't much to do, walking down the street or taking a dog for a walk could be the highlight of your day. 
<laughs> and would we consider making more investments in these safe outdoor activities? So I put an item on there for some outdoor uh, fitness equipment. This, and we talked about um, scavenger hunts on the trails and things that would allow adults, um, people with pets and families to find other things to do in the community. We are going to be town bound for a little while longer and um, it's good to get people outside. So that was also in the package of items that I presented last night. And uh, like I said, we're excited about what we're hearing out of the new federal administration. Um, you know, the cities have not directly received any aid funding, but the states have given us some that we were able to use last year. We think the package um, that is being proposed right now is actually going to put dollars into cities and dollars into communities directly, much needed. And so um, very supportive. I talk with our representative about it. Um, I send them uh, data and dashboards that we have to show the need for food security, housing security, and business support uh, so that they have data that she can use when she's in um, her role in Washington. Um, and then I was gonna move off COVID for a little bit, unless there's any questions and talk a, a little bit about some things that are in Issaquah's next year work plan, but maybe I'll just take a quick little break. And Autumn, if you're monitoring the chat, if anybody has any questions on COVID, we can also go to questions at the end. I just kind of want to get through my piece so that these guys can talk to each other. So are you seeing any questions? I think I was muting myself while someone else was, or I'm muting, sorry. Um, no, I don't see any, I don't see any questions. Okay, great. Let me run through a, a couple of highlights of things that we're working on in 2021. So uh, Council did approve their budget last fall and they've got a few things that are coming down. One of the things the city is working on is the Police Accountability, Equity and Human Services Action Plan. This is the work plan that came, uh, was created, that we created out of the mayor's office after the death of George Floyd and wanting to work with community groups and others to um, address this within our own community, provide places for conversation, uh, difficult conversations, and you know, see what we wanna do different. It actually informed uh, quite a bit about my approach into um, looking at public safety a little more holistically in what, what does public safety mean to the community? What does it mean to all members of the community and how we might change our team to um, provide the right resource for whatever crisis our responders are going to. I've had great interaction with our um, EMTs and current fire department, police department, and our human services department. So um, we started with the work plan last year. We have about nine months to go through that. And tomorrow, the city's human services commission, which is a volunteer commission, are hosting two virtual community convenings to discuss the role of residents in the city's equity initiatives and to brainstorm about creating a new board uh, or commission on equity. And so I'm excited to listen in on their conversation. If you are on Gilman Boulevard at all, uh, um, in, the, um, Gilman, in the Gilman Village area, you will know that our major trail comes out off of Rainier Boulevard, um, right by the chamber's office. But in order to cross, you have to walk about 300 or 500 feet further to the west to get a light. So as part of a new development on the north side of Gilman, we're going to move the crosswalk and align the two trail pieces and have a new street light there with a um, pedestrian all walk signal. It will be the first pedestrian style signal that we've had in town and really excited about it. Um, I believe that they're still on track. Uh, Autumn, I don't know if you know the date when we're switching over. It was originally January, but I don't think it's January now. It's, I'm quite excited for getting some video footage of the poles being installed. Some um, happy good news. <laughs> uh, so mid-February is, is okay. when it's gonna be ready. So um, that's super exciting. It was a missing link. It was a break in the trail. Um, that's a ridiculous road to cross as a pedestrian. So this is pretty exciting. And then we have a couple of projects downtown. Um, council approves moving ahead with turning Alder Street 
which is, if I get it all right, uh, Vino Bello, Palage, Subway, and Domino's Pizza. Um, they have a road that comes off of Front Street on either side, and um, the council invested in a downtown streetscape plan a few years ago and has a vision for creating a festival street, which is a more pedestrian friendly, interesting area with night lighting and street furniture and additional landscape. So there's some components of that that will be constructed this year. And um, if you like the streetery, and I hope you did, mo most people did, um, there's a, a piece coming called, um, I don't know if we call it park, oh, we do call it parklets. Um, that's a little more permanent where um, parking spots, and I think it's only one or two on Front Street, are turned into outdoor seating areas. And you've probably seen it if you've traveled in any other little towns in Washington this summer. A lot of them have popped up where it's just a way to expand outdoors and create a little more activity on the street. So there is some funding to create a couple of those parklets right on Front Street. And uh, one of the big, big, big heavy lifts, which I don't think, you know, unless you're a land use geek like myself and Connie and a few others, <laughs> this probably doesn't sound particularly exciting, but we have a huge project on the docket, which is the updating of the land use code. And the land use code is um, a set of rules that we use to assess the fits of a new development or a redevelopment coming into town. It tells you um, how things should be laid out and how they should interact with the spaces around them and um, the amenities that are placed on the site. It can really um, make a project work or not work. We have a code that was, I'm even guessing, maybe written or updated significantly in the 70s. And so this, this kind of major update doesn't happen very often, um, but the council is gonna be doing that and using some citizen boards and commissions through it. Um, I think it can really, if done correctly, strengthen the character of the city. So I'm pretty excited about this project. Um, there'll be a lot of meetings on it, a lot of discussion, and um, it's probably about 12 or 18 months of work to do this one, but it is starting uh, this year. And then check your mailboxes in late winter. We're gonna be sending out um, a randomized survey to many households in Issaquah. In Issaquah. We conduct a statistically valid survey every other year, just so we can learn how to improve city services. So. We will be doing that again this year. It helps us understand what's important to the community and um, things that you're happy with, things that you're not happy with, things that you would like us to work on. Um, we opened a temporary dog park this uh, past fall at Pickering Barn. We plan to have this dog park locate over a period of time in several different locations in the city. The city doesn't have a dog park right now. Um, we have plans to build a permanent one. Um, Right now it is at Pickering Barn and it's gonna next be at Squawk Valley Park, which is at the south end of town from February to May. And then it'll move to the Issaquah Community Center from June to October. Um, the, another um, item that we're working on is we've recently formed something called the Green Issaquah Partnership. And it's to foster long-term support for restoration and maintenance of Issaquah's parks and natural areas. And we will be looking for volunteers. There's a few of the neighborhood champions here that I know are really interested in the forested parkland and open spaces that Issaquah has acquired over the, the last decade or so and in making sure that we steward them proper, properly. So um, Green Issaquah Partnership should help us do that and also help us engage the community and service groups and our youth in, in working on that. Um, something else coming this year for residents is online utility billing. We're going to launch that on our website. And just wanted to talk a little bit about a few events that um, uh, Autumn and her team helped with last year that I think were, were fun and different during COVID. The 4th of July parade brought to you was something we never tried before. It went through a bunch of different neighborhoods and it was kind of fun to see how many people came out and waved. Um, so uh, that I think was a really, really good COVID idea and 
some of the things that were tried this year, we're going to sort of test with the community and see if there's some new things that we tried that folks liked and we should continue to do. And also, we know it was a big disappointment, especially in the Highlands, I see Christy. Um, Halloween is huge in the Highlands. And coming up with some new programs and publicizing them, like the You've Been Booed was one of the ideas. And again, just trying to find ways to do things safe during the pandemic. Um, this year, I think everybody's hopeful that we may enjoy some of these holidays in the ways we used to, but we may also have to maybe take a half step and still have some of these new ideas in there because we need to get through the vaccination process. And um, so we have a few steps to go. So Autumn, I'm, I took so much time talking, I'm sorry. Um, those were the updates. What I'd like to do now is give an opportunity for each of our neighborhood um, representatives to talk about their neighborhood and what is going on and maybe um, even you know sharing some ideas of something you've tried to address a problem share it with the rest of the group so we can see you know i just like to hear what's going on so thank you for letting me give you all the news first <laughs> thanks mary polly that we had um one question come in via chat from mary lynch great thank you Hi, this is Mary. I just, I'll just first, I just wanted to talk about COVID and the vaccination. And there's a lot of yep. misunderstanding that with the new rulings as of last week, it's all school employees, not just teachers that are over um, 50. So that that's something that, you know, some people think it's just teachers. It's all school employees. And that, that would make uh, sense, Mary. Yeah, I know, but a lot of people yeah. don't understand that. And okay. Bob, we just had a meeting today. They still can't promise us when that's going to be. So yeah. um, part of my concern there is everybody's trying to set something up and they're going to steal, you know, available supplies. Because the other thing, um, QFC, Fred Myers, all have been trying to get vaccine. They have their online appointment systems already set up. People, especially seniors, are used to going into Fred Myers and QFCs to get their flu vaccines. Yep. And we need to be supporting our those partners to get the vaccines there first, because that's where a lot of these elderly people know to go, are comfortable, and can schedule appointment. And my fear is with these big, you know, things, you're going to have lines of people you know, even though they don't have an appointment, are going to come in and try. So let's yeah, get yeah. the people that are already set up vaccines and then try and do some of these others. Because um, it's going to be ongoing for another year. Because the other thing that I like to point out with the schools, there's still nothing in the near term, the next six months, for anybody under 18. And so that's right, why right. it's vitally important to get the school staff, with their saying they're going back to school, all of the school employees need to have their vaccines as soon as possible. That's it on yeah. that. I've got more later, but. <laughs> well, thank you. It's good. To, it's good. I don't know if everybody knows, but Mary works for the school district in the transportation department, and that's good to hear. I think it has to be everybody. There's no doubt um, that it has to be not just teachers, but everybody. So we'll make sure in our messaging, if we are, you know, um, getting information in that and we're being asked to share. We'll just make sure, Mary, that we're including what what you just said. And I think we sort of saw this coming. Um, we knew that once they said they had a vaccine, that this is going to be like a horror movie where we're, we're in the future world and we're all, all fighting with each other and clawing at each other to get at the vaccine pile because there's not enough vaccine. Um, and it's been really hard to do good messaging. Because you hear about, you know, um, a senior care center that has a relationship with CVS. They have a contract, so they all get it. But then you hear about Providence Point, who doesn't have a contract with anybody, and they're really upset. And so, you know, just trying to message this has been an absolute nightmare. Um, I liked Connie's suggestion today. She um, wrote in or her question saying, how are we going to know, you know, where everybody is that has to get it? Um, that's a great question. I mean, that's that's the kind of stuff that we have to be working on. Um, even though public health isn't a city thing, um, this year it is. <laughs> this is we're the one. If 
if we don't try and wrestle this tiger to the ground and get all the different sources out there, nobody's going to do it for us. It's been just a misery for some of our seniors to try and navigate this. Um, so thank you, Mary. And then I wonder if we have a volunteer uh, who wants to start the conversation about what's going on in your neighborhood. Um, what do we need? What is it that we may not know about? What is something that you've tried that uh, made a huge difference? Um, and you want to share it with the group or whatever you want. Volunteer. Oh, come on, people. Connie, <laughs> feel free to unmute yourself. Go for it. Um, this is Susan Neville, and I just had a question. Um, when you say something in your neighborhood that made a difference, could you mm -hmm. define that? Because I'm new to this meeting. Um, oh, sure. Sure. Um, when we were talking about where we want our neighborhood program to go, which is really about trying to make more connective tissue between our neighborhood and the city, but also with the neighborhoods themselves, um, we want to be able to share and build off of really good ideas. So, for example, I'll go back to the July 4th bringing it to you um, parade that the city did. We had heard about smaller versions of this in some neighborhoods. And because they were being well received, you know, we took it to a different scale and we went citywide with it and planned a route that would go through lots and lots of cities. And then afterwards, we got feedback. Some neighborhoods, the communication channels weren't as great and they didn't know it was coming. <laughs> Others, like South Cove, Highlands, ate it up, lined the streets, right? So, what we're trying to do is we recognize we have both organized and unorganized or organically organized neighborhoods. So how do we, how do we just like share good ideas, um, feed off of someone else's good idea instead of Autumn and I sitting in the office going, oh, what should we do next? <laughs> we don't know. Like I live in Old Town, she lives on Squawk. So that's, the meeting is about that and also an opportunity if the, to ask questions of the mayor about anything else. So really, Susan, um, what's going on in the Newport neighborhood? Um, what is getting people excited? What is um, annoying people? Something like yeah. that. Um, if you're willing, I can just share. The sure. uh, Halloween um, item, the boo bags, you know, the little boo bags. Our neighborhood went crazy, all the adults. We had such a good time with that. <laughs> I don't know what that is. What are you talking about? Halloween boo. Oh, boo bags. Boo bags. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. So every, good. everybody was doing it. And oh. we, we also brought our friends into it. So we went outside the neighborhood, which was really fun. Um, and we gave it to people like who couldn't get out. You oh. know, older and elderly. So what I was thinking, um, the paper went out to a lot of people and at the bottom and I think sometimes people are, aren't aware of all the fun things you are doing that at the bottom of the paper you can say go to this link for more fun Ooh, like it yeah and make sure like the it. link works <laughs> that's not a jab <laughs> well I know there's a bunch of people on here who tell me when links don't <laughs> Believe me, I get those emails. <laughs> Which, by the way, I'm making fun of it, but I appreciate it. I know how frustrating it is when you want to get something and the link is broken. So those of you that have my number, feel free to tell me it's broken. Susan and, and others too on the call, I'm also interested in how neighborhoods are communicating with each other. And I, I know that post-COVID, there has been changes in neighborhoods about how how people are sharing information. So that's also um, of interest to me. Um, I, I know where I live um, in the woods that I think sometimes the best way is either my husband will forward me an HOA email or there's a sign put out at the entrance of the woods that if you drive out of your neighborhood, you see that the Boy Scouts are picking up the Christmas trees or whatever it is that's happening um, in our neighborhood. So um, I'm also just curious of what platforms neighborhoods are using um, to share information just as we're we're starting to ramp up and and we'll have a lot of really important information to be sharing soon in the coming year. So Christy, go ahead. Christy. 
Uh, well, on, on that note, Autumn, um, one of the things that we do annually, COVID or not, in this Highlands is we serve at Highlands Council, we survey the community using a survey monkey to see how we're doing on um, the items that fall within under our mission. And uh, one of the things that we're learning about what platforms the community, community is using, we've had an incredible response to our survey this January with almost 400 people completing already. And um, Facebook is still the leading way that um, people are getting their digital um, media. You know, so we, you know, a couple of years ago, we were wondering what Nextdoor was going to do to, um, you know, to how messaging gets out. But but uh, Connections News is still the most favored um, news resource for for our neighborhood from a print standpoint. But Facebook. Um, is uh, far and above the lead so far, and we expect it'll hold. Um, and then our e newsletter that comes out weekly. Um, okay. And yeah. Um, okay, if you have more in your list, good, because there's two things I specifically wanted you to talk about, and that mm -hmm. was um, how you're doing the online things you're doing, like bingos and book clubs. Mm -hmm. And the other thing was I'd love to know the response to your Christmas caroling that goes through the neighborhood. So, yeah, I'll, yeah. Let, I'll let Sarah and Alyssa talk to, to that. They were, they produced that whole Santa Cruz piece. Uh, but, um, you know, virtual programming, we, we know um, has created a lot of fatigue. Uh, you know, people will say they're getting tired of it, but the Isqua Arts Commission allowed us to use some Highlands Day sponsorship money that we didn't get to spend on Highlands Day last year uh, in, a, in a different way. And so um, we have been doing um, professionally facilitated family friendly art projects on Saturday mornings that have really been incredibly. Um, uh, uh, the participation has just been really great. People have loved it. The feedback has been great and that was uh, funded in part by the Squat Arts Commission. So we, we think that uh, we've got some momentum going there. And then to layer on top of that with Lunar New Year coming, um, we have a cooking demo by a local chef that'll be focusing on a, a traditional Vietnamese Lunar New Year uh, dinner and uh, the response for registrations on that, it happens on February 2nd, it has already um, exceeded our expectations. So we, we think that we've kind of found a niche in virtual programming for, for what people are still willing to log on to do. So um, I would say that. Uh, and then just a couple other things. we. Um, we are still having really tremendous success working with Bloodworks Northwest for our blood drives at Blakely Hall. We have blood drives on February 5th, 6th, and 9th, and also on February 12th and 13th. The um, the 5th and 6th and 9th, I believe, are sold out, but there are still there's still room on the 12th and 13th, and then they'll be back in March, and then they'll be back at the end of April. We did an interview with um, an executive from Bloodworks Northwest that we will put out in a video later this week. And um, it was just very emotional for them that they lost a lot of their uh, blood collection opportunities when high schoolers, um, you know, used to go to high schools and, and a lot of their um, blood volume came from that. And they were really concerned about where they were going to make up that difference. And not just Isqua Highlands, but the, the greater community of Isqua has really um, stepped up for every blood drive we've had. And so thank you to to um, all our citizens for supporting Bloodworks Northwest. Christy, just behavior. let me uh, make a comment on that, and that is that it points out that um, the benefits we used to have when we could gather in large groups was it made it much easier for people, for like Bloodworks Northwest. And so yeah. I was just writing a note here to um, see, get Autumn maybe to explore uh, whether or not there is a way that we can do this as well with some of our retail partners on the Valley floor and closer to other neighborhoods. Um, mm -hmm. because, you know, there's not going to be a huge number of high schoolers back in high school. This year. Yeah. And uh, Autumn, happy to make the introduction to Landon if you don't already have that. And, um, you know, I'm sure they'd be thrilled to be able to, to get more going that way. Um, yeah. And then the last thing I'll just add in talking about getting more people outside doing activities, we are working with the city of Midland Park Zoo for an adventure lab outdoor scavenger hunt that'll happen this spring. Mm -hmm. And uh, some of that will happen in the Highlands. And um, we did some scavenger hunts last year in June and September, and those were, um, you know, seemed to be successful as well. So I, I could keep talking, but I think that's those are some highlights. To thank to, you. To I'm gonna 
Jump over to Connie. <laughs> you have to get off mute. <laughs> it surprised me because I just got back on. So that leads me <laughs> to my issue. Perhaps we have an issue on Squawk Mountain with connectivity mm -hmm. of both electricity and that leads to uh, video issues. So I'd been doing really good. So I just invested a whole bunch of money on, on making sure that I had the most stable system possible. And then in the middle of this, I was like, oh, gone. And I think it's because it's raining. Woohoo. So it would be Im important, I think, in our continuing world to ensure that we have uh, both power and cable connectivity citywide that's efficient and effective and perhaps for many people not quite so expensive because I think in our lower income people they can't afford it um, so if if I had a a bugaboo to pick about my mountain it would be that one it but this isn't new to Mary Lou it's just <laughs> Um, one of the communication issues that we have in this town is what it might be happening to one person, but they don't really know if it's happening to the next person and the next person, the next person. So we don't really know what's happening neighborhood wide or citywide. We have a few people who are loud and you hear from them all the time, but we've never figured out an effective way to hear from more people. Next door is interesting. That's what I was going to ask you. Can you talk city, about Squawk and what you guys use? Is next door the big one? Well, that's where we talk to each other, right? But then the city, the the city can't look at next door, mm -mm. and so <laughs> I find I don't follow the city on Facebook. I don't do it on Instagram because I have plenty going on there, and I'm watching all the city meetings, right? So. Uh, and then you, everything is technical. So anyone who is not a techno person gets left out of the conversation. Um, and so I went from my own small personal issue and blossomed out in this in, into this entire, how do you engage more people more effectively, which I think is a general government issue. Mm -hmm. But um, I am a fan, especially in COVID, if you're having an event or you have a city issue, then you can use the signage. People drive by it, people yeah. are out walking. And so those are effective forms of communication. However, it's always a push, it's not a pull. So every time you do that, it's important to provide people a place to also give their information back to you because you don't have 30,000 people on this call. Um, no, not even close. No. So <laughs> how do we how do we do that in a way that it's for every person as compared to you know the geek me, the geek and 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 other people who are connected though not obsessed. Yes. You're obsessed. No, yes, I everything you said. I didn't say I, anything I, I know. else. Call me Pure on confession. and I'm up for it. Here it's your confession. Um, a couple of thoughts, Connie. One is that, um, yes, Squawk Mountain is on our radar, um, and also power um, redundancy is on our uh, radar. And, um, you know, we don't, we have more power outages than a lot of other towns that are further to the east of us. So we have issues and that impacts communication, especially when you have a, a disaster like we're having right now where people are working from home and their kids are home and they're, all that's going on. Um, but for the signage piece of it, I know in, in my brain thinking about whether it's blood drives, whether it's um, a mass vaccination site, whether it's getting out the message that there's appointments available for mobile, we are gonna to have to go to, um, I just lost Autumn off of Squawk Mountain for a second. <laughs> gonna to have to go to, it's a good thing I live in Old Town. Uh, we're gonna to have to um, go to more actual signage and we're gonna to have to have more message boards because we are going to need to find uh, other ways to, to get it because not everybody uses the 
technology tools that we have and we don't have a local paper and I could go on and on. So, so that is a really can I interrupt good can point. I interrupt the mayor for just a second? Because sure. it's fun. Yeah, sure. It's my kind of call. So for example, in Redmond, they have these massive A frames mm -hmm. that are like eleven feet tall. And so they're in places where people go. They're in their parks and their everything. And they are there all the time. And so they're the community bulletin board places and yep. they vary the messaging on those boards. Now, every time I've tried that in this town, they say nobody uses signage. Well, I I I I I think they I think I really think they do. And I think so they do, yeah. That's a decent for me template. Okay, I'll stop interrupting you now. Really? Promise? No. <laughs> okay, let's get another neighborhood in here. <laughs> uh, go ahead. Hi. Hi, Mayor Polly. Um, we've met briefly, but um, I represent the woods. I do the activities for the woods and everything. Hi, Colleen. Um, or slash Morgan's Ridge. Um, but uh, I did want to suggest one thing. It'd be awesome to have a database that maybe the presidents of the HOAs had access to to communicate with each other. Um, sure. Or even like maybe some big Facebook group or something, because I know here in our HOA, like our board has spent forever trying to discuss just streamlining our paint palettes within the neighborhood because it's like 40, 50 years, 40 years old. And we, you've probably familiar with the Smurf Blue House in our neighborhood. Yeah, um, I, I had to go through that paint review, and I lived there. And then when Smurf oh. Blue came, my husband's like, "What's going on?" <laughs> <laughs> um, so we're trying to like streamline it, but what part of the struggle with the process is like we know the Highlands. Yeah, like you guys have a paint palette. Uh, I'm guessing Talis does, Kalahani. And we were kind of like we stalking not. the websites. Squawk <laughs> like, wants like, one. <laughs> what? I'm teasing. Connie's taking not for squawk, but you guys uh, are on no, squawk no, too. No, this is the woods. This yeah. is the woods. I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I'm just saying it'd be great to have like a database so that way it's easy for our president to just email whoever is in charge of Talis. Yes. Would just you like us please. to, would you like us just to have, um, you provide your contact information. I mean, Autumn probably has it. Do you want it all shared and pick the tool of your choice to do well, it? I, I, mean, and, I don't know if there would be, because I know it constantly changes. Like, you know, a lot of HOAs have yeah. high turnover and stuff. Um, Colleen, this idea came up at our last meeting. So last time our neighborhood champions got together, uh, we walked away with two things. One is let's do this every quarter. Mm -hmm. Well, three things. The other is we kind of, we, we most like, while we like updates from the city, which is a good part of staying connected, mm -hmm. having time to network with each other and share ideas was really important. And the third was your idea, which was, mm -hmm. can the city um, be the repository for contact information for HOAs? Mm -hmm. um, and so I sent an email out and I, I heard from a couple people, but not everyone. And so I think as my next step, I might start emailing people individually just to get their approval. Because part of it was, are you okay in us sharing your contact info? Um, so like I think I just need to take more of a targeted approach instead of a group email to everybody. Yeah, if there was some, um, I don't know if there would be like something on the Issaquah government website. Yeah. That was just like, not super obvious to get to, but the presidents have access to. So it's yes. just like Talis, President, Klahani, yeah. pres or like, you know. Yeah. Um, just so, or, you know, to, and that also allows us, I think, to communicate with each other. Yeah. Because um, when it came to the 4th of July parade, I I think I may have seen it on like a Facebook group or something. Um, so I was the one that like reached out to the HOA and was like, hey, can I email our neighborhood about it? Um, and we had a big turnout. Um, yes, you did. Mm -hmm. So. Um, but we didn't go all the way. So because I live in the woods, as soon as I saw the map, I was like thinking I would change the route. It would be so fun if the neighborhood drew their route for us, right? Oh. And then we put the pieces together um, because did we go to Morgan's Ridge or did we just scoot in no, and go down to Innisfil? We just put down Calmia, right. yeah. which, was, which makes sense when you have like all those vehicles. Um, I mean, yeah, you could go through Morgan's Ridge, but no, it just went yeah. down Calmia and out through Inniswood. 
Um, yeah. So like the route made sense. Um, yeah, it was a good, you know, it was good. And then having shown this group the route and having you guys push and pull and make us go down <laughs> different roads would have been fine. I mean, yeah. the, the parade for those that participated in it was such, so much fun. Yeah. Really, really fun. And then, you know, the Highlands and Talos are um, urban village design, and they're sort of set up with these structures in place. And this is trying to create some organic structure for everybody else, too, so that um, we're putting all these pieces together. And so, yeah, that's a great idea. I love the communication group, and I would really like if July 4th becomes a thing to yeah. have you guys tell us which streets you want us to go on because it was really fun. Yeah, it was really great. Yeah, a couple. Um, I thought I mentioned a couple of the other things our neighborhood has done. Um, we we've been doing boo bags in the past, but um, we did we've done a Halloween parade. Um, that was highly successful. Um, and like the kids had an absolute blast. Um, and then before COVID, we had a, a movie night with the neighborhood. Um. And that was like the first, we only did it the one year because I'm new, newer to the HOA. So, um, and then COVID happened, but like, it'd be great. Even the city of Issaquah to do a big movie night. If you had a big screen, like, you know, um, Redmond does it at Marimore. Yeah. They do it at Marimore. But just Where did you like show a, the movie? Where did you guys do that? What? Where did you oh, show the, the movie? Court. Yeah. The tennis court. And, and then my husband, like bought, a, yeah, my husband or... bought a screen um, and a, board and then we just popped it up so we had like you know we have 200 houses and about like 30 people showed up the first year we did it um but yeah we didn't do it this year for covid reasons um so that's a great idea and that actually might be a covid friendly idea if we mm -hmm. still have some restrictions in place this summer is setting mm -hmm. up these um getting a kit that different neighborhoods could use and set up um, to do their own movie nights or backside of the police station and painting little circles on Memorial Field and hanging yeah. a big sheet down there. But I love that idea. And I think actually that's something that we ought to be looking into for this summer because we're not all going to be back in on mass, but there are some things we will be able to do. So that's a great mm -hmm. idea. The retaining wall uh, off of I-90 back behind Old Town. Hmm. Too much noise. At night in the summer, maybe. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, a spot to the movie. Connie, also too, I'm thinking of any of the big buildings in Old Town that have um, a blank side and then either a trail corridor or something. So you just have that space to set it out. Um, doesn't have to be fancy. There's been some fabulous online pictures of movie theaters set up in alleys before COVID that were just like charming as anything. They were great. Right. And, and we have the huge state park where you could do something enormous. And mm -hmm. Mary just threw in the chat too that there's a wall, um, the park and anthology also has something that you could hang down from and, and area for people to sit in. And mm -hmm. nobody knows anthology is there except for the people who live on Newport Way who had to put up with the construction and knew there was gonna be a little park on the other side of the street. So that's a cool idea too. Colleen, do you have some more that you wanna share with us? Um, I know somebody mentioned doing scavenger hunts. Um, I have created those for our neighborhood. I, to be honest, I don't know if anyone does them, but um, I did them when people put up like the Halloween decorations and the Christmas decorations. Or I think I did an Easter one too, maybe. Um, but yeah, I just I put them in the email blast as just an attachment to the neighborhood and was like, you know, if you want to do it, you know, and I made it custom to the neighborhood. So it was unique things. Um, those are the big ones. I mean, if you can think, of, since you've lived in the neighborhood before, if you can think of anything, but, um, but we primarily communicate through email and then we do have a, um, for some specific events, we do have a sign we post mm -hmm. at our entryway. Mm -hmm. Um, and honestly, I think our biggest concern as a neighborhood right now is the security. Um, it's been really hard trying to figure out like the electrical spot and, and like trying to coordinate with the other neighborhood. Um, 
because we would like to put up security cameras, um, but just basic security is our toughest thing, mm -hmm. not our toughest, but it's on the top of the HOAs list for our neighborhood. Yep, that makes a lot of sense. Um, Colleen, I'm getting flashbacks of Mayor Polly um, and a Easter bunny at the park. <laughs> like a couple of years ago, probably before you, you moved in. But um, I, 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 I just, I've, been, I've been thinking about, I kind of went through, you know, at least the holidays, there was a distraction. Oh, um, God. Not that the holidays even, are over. There's even pictures of it. It's embarrassing. <laughs> I, I just, I'm starting to wonder what else we can do for our neighborhoods um that even is holiday related you know is it is it something around valentine's day or is it something where we're, we are leaving eggs at each other's yards um so you know i i'm i am thinking toward you know the kind of in the spring and summer what things we can do to still build some sense of community among neighborhoods um so anyway if folks have ideas i would love to hear them too do not involve Mayor Polly in a huge, massive group of people. Yeah. <laughs> Don't have any costumes or have me with costume characters anymore. It's only not my gig. Alyssa? I, uh, yeah. do, do you have a costume? What? I know no. it's missing. I think Someone the person who had it moved out too, so we don't have one. So. Yeah, so I well, know the person who was the bunny who made me be with the bunny. So, and so I thought okay. she left the costume. Okay. So, I, right. I think her daughter has the costume because her daughter's in that house. So, okay. Alyssa, what's Hi. up? So, Hi. Just real quick, uh, it's so funny. My name is Alisa. So, it's, you know, Alisa. Alisa, so <laughs> thank I, you. Um, but I, well, what I want to share, actually piggybacking off of what Christy shared earlier, you know, we're a unique situation, right? I mean, we're, I describe Grand Ridge Plaza as a building without walls, you know, because we're private property. So, you know, one of the challenges and the reason why I joined this call um, was to actually, you know, get your thoughts in terms of what we look like for the next 96 months from now. One of the struggles, you know, I'm sure you can imagine you have is we, we are looked at as a platform for all these various activations and activities throughout the year. And, you know, decisions have to be made in terms of making sure we don't compromise the health of the community that we sit in. And so that is kind of like the driving force of what we do. Um, you know, one of the things, you know, a couple of things I wanted to share with you guys tonight is, um, you know, the, the Santa Cruz in the Highlands is actually was just something that we, as, you know, when I say we as a team between IHCA and the Grand Ridge especially, um, I cover the West Coast for Regency, so to speak. So a lot of the things that we do at Grand Ridge, honestly, is because I'm literally duplicating or replicating things I'm doing in other markets for the sake of my sanity. Um, and, you know, in terms of the communication platform, Facebook actually is still pretty a strong platform for us. And I know Connie had mentioned that, um, you know, not everybody has that opportunity to access for technology. So to her point, I know we are looking at um, Wi-Fi opportunities as a whole and how we can kind of enhance that. You know, and, and please understand stuff that I'm mentioning right now is really like an ideation stages. You know, these are conversations I'm having in general, just even some random thoughts in my head as we talk some of these things through. But, you know, um, being in the retail sector, as I've been throughout my entire career, when you look at a platform such as Gant Ridge, it's kind of like, what can we do to support what you guys are doing in terms of getting some communication out? Right. I'll use Chrissy as an example. She emailed me, I think it was August. There was a survey that she needed some help in terms of distributing just to kind of keep a pulse on, I believe it was a transportation initiative that you were working on, Christy, and utilizing Grand Ridge as a platform. We are very fortunate in Grand Ridge that we actually have a reach within 15 mile radius. That is my true trade area. And I, it's, it's a full credit to the merchants that we have on our property, you know, between the big box tenants and some of the, our restaurants, our eaters especially, that are um, favorites within a 15 mile radius. And the, the Santa uh, event was a couple of things. We wanted to provide, as Sarah mentioned earlier, just something to give the community kind of, even if it was five minutes, just to kind of take you away from COVID everything, right? And, and just kind of reinfuse some sense of normalcy in terms of that holiday feel good. There were a couple of other things I did in other markets that I'll share with you all. Um, again, like to Chrissy's point, the virtual, uh, activations. I had two virtual activations I conducted in other two markets, one specifically in Northern California. We hosted what we called a gleeful holiday over a course of a five Sunday period. And to date, all six of our videos are racking up 40,000 views and we featured four musical groups 
kind of uh, in the area that that center that is in is is in um, similar to Issaquah. You know, like I'm hearing all these different communities. I was writing down all these names. <laughs> so that's that same type of market. So we were pulling high school or some women's choir group or what have you. We were able to give them a financial donation and we provided a platform via Facebook. And Facebook has some amazing presentation um, capabilities. Facebook Premiere is something that we utilized. And then we hosted our own Grand Ridge Plaza virtual Santa visit for four hours where kids just came through in the room for Grand Ridge Plaza. One, one Thursday we had a cruise, we canceled it due to weather and Santa just sat there and Facebook again as a platform hosted mm -hmm. this private event for Grand Ridge uh, trade area families. And we put the call out, it was less than a week, right? And we were pounding the pavement as hard as we could. And we literally have this, these cute little vignette videos and kids just popping up. You know, Sarah even said she kind of, you know, um, and our Santa just sat there and he visited. If you wanted to hang out for an hour, you could. If not, you can just, you know, leave out. So what that told all this to say, what that kind of told me is that if we can create an opportunity, because to your point, Mayor Polly, I'm planning that we'll still be in kind of this transition phase for roughly about a year. It'll be great if we can do some true physical plant activations at Grand Ridge. However, for the sake of me wanting to be mindful of the health and well-being of my uh, community, so to speak, in Grand Ridge, we are taking the approach of heavy digital. And if there's a physical element that we can do safely, we are more than happy to engage and explore and do that. Um, but because we had such great success, so to speak, and being a little nuanced in certain things, uh, we can do that. I had another property where we hosted a dance party for two hours. I had a DJ um, and, and he was up on the screen and. <laughs> And people are dancing in their homes and are they were in their backyards or some people safely kind of congregated where it was a uh, government mandate you could. And uh, we, we did that. So, you know, as you would imagine, just in my space, there's a lot of things that we did do a lot of different different places that I think if, you know, this being a resource for me is hearing this feedback. I can then take this and go back to Grand Ridge because, you know, we don't have a lot of money, honestly, for the property, as you mentioned earlier. You know, there was a financial hit, so to speak. Um, so we have to be, you know, two things. I had to make sure that the dollars driving that ROI and that we're supporting our merchants um, and, you know, and that we're able to serve the community as best we can. So um, all of that, you know, in terms of like, again, we're looking at a more of a hybrid, more digital focus, making sure we can connect with the right partners to get people who we can't necessarily reach via our digital platforms. Um, and making sure that we are supporting the community. That was one great thing about last year is I had to strike my entire marketing plan, but I was able to reinvest those dollars in a bunch of community organizations. And Lisa, that is, that is super cool. I mean, I think the one benefit you have is Issaquah needs to have, this is um, my administration, is to need to create public spaces for public gatherings. And in your area and in areas down on Gilman Boulevard, I don't believe when we did have the opportunity to take advantage of limited social gathering, we really used those spaces particularly as much as we could. It was easier to do the streetery and create something in that 10 block area. But I've heard a lot of uh, comments about well, why not in my part of town and really the opportunity is with Regency and those other bigger spaces on the valley floor to do things. We're taking a very similar approach to you. Um, we're looking at the things that we used to do and we're planning backwards to a go no go date so that we know that on May 15, if the rules are this, we will make a cancellation announcement. Um, but we're also thinking about what events we can do under the new rules so that we have things to roll out. We just want to push the, this may not sound right, but push the boundary on what the current science says is safe and get people to come to stuff in a safe way. There is community hesitancy. I know people who still haven't done takeout food. They've only prepared their own meals since March. So there's a community hesitancy to do stuff. But the city is really interested in keeping track of the regulations and then coming up with things to push to the boundary of what's allowed. I mean, when they get to say, we get to have 10 people together from outside of your house, well, what kind of event can you do where you can have 10 people together? And so we're following a very similar track to you. Um, low cost, very, very low cost. But you do have an opportunity up there because of your the space that you can create can be 
a community gathering spot. Um, so that's great. Thank you for the update. I like it. Thank you. Thank you. Digital car show. Well, that's a good one. <laughs> I did a car show in LA, by the way. So if you guys ever, um, we have a property, two properties here in LA. We do a car show once a month in Orange County, which I'm saying Orange County roughly. I'm sure the reputation in Orange County precedes itself at this point, but um, <laughs> because Regency actually hosts it, I'm able to dictate terms in terms of how you engage in the property. So our properties are probably one of the one spaces in Orange County where they have to wear masks and things of that nature if they want to do their car show. So yeah. we've done that also. So that's a great idea as well. Yeah. So just encouraging everyone here, throw any ideas on the table that you can, um, that we can, that are new or that help us with the rules. Autumn, I wonder if you can talk a bit about the food truck permits, because I have some anecdotal information, but I'll let you go first and see what's going on with food trucks. Yeah, um, and Mary, I'll put a link into some information of just what's required for food trucks to serve um, in Issaquah. And um, the if, if a neighborhood wants to host a food truck in the city's right of way, um, that's evaluated right now on a case by case basis. So I'm thinking, <laughs> Mary Polly, if you're thinking about the anecdotal side of it, we we did hear some reports that neighborhoods were hosting food trucks and that there were just way too many people congregating together, um, kind of like my lemonade stand back in the day. <laughs> um, and so and so there, that was the concern is, you know, and one thing that we were um, sending out as far as notices to neighborhood champions is this concern about if you're hosting a food truck, uh, make sure that, you're, that it's not becoming a neighborhood party. In right. Person. So I have a couple things to add to that. Um, I'm a big fan of food trucks. I'm also a big fan of brick and mortar. And so those things can, can conflict. And so I hear a lot, but why don't you do more food trucks on, allow more food trucks on Gilman Boulevard? Well, it's because the restaurants will run me up <laughs> if I do it. However, within your neighborhood, if let's take, um, the woods, for example, if the woods decided that um, looking at the current rate guidance, there was a way to park a food truck on private property or community property, not on the right of way, and you are committed to safely following the protocols, painting little stripes on the sidewalk or whatever you want to do, uh, communities can do that without a city permit. So it's only when a community says we want to have food trucks on the public right of way that I run into a bunch of legal hurdles. And so I was talking with some South Cove uh, residents last year and I said, find a flat driveway and put the truck on the, put the truck on someone's driveway and draw a bunch of lines on the sidewalk. I don't care about people standing on the sidewalk. I have an issue when a commercial operation is in the public right of way. That's when I got a rule book and I got to apply the rules. So there, and there are ways for communities to bring amenities into the community. It's just try and keep me out of it. Try and not do it on the street because then uh, I get into issues on a permitting use of the right of way and all that. So I, there's ways to do it. Um, we can help you figure it out in your neighborhood if if it's not really clear, but if that's something you want to do and, and people are spaced out and it makes people feel good to do it, food trucks can be a great idea. And if anyone needs help or assistance in that process, Thomas and I can, can be that help and liaison too. Oh, good question. Um, we have some that are licensed to work in Issaquah on food trucks, so Anna may be able to provide that. Um, the other thing I was going to talk about, and I don't know that it's possible this year, but at some point I'd really like this group to talk about um, what we want to do as a block party community. And so not from the security part of block party, but um, there's an opportunity to be able to do more within the neighborhoods to create some neighborhood fun and joy at no cost. Um, I just need to understand what the community wants so I can work on the rules. But for example, I was talking with Elizabeth Mopan, who's on a different part of Squawk Mountain, and we talked about what's the simplest way for them just to like be able to have something happen out on the street without having to go through an expensive per city permit process. So, you know, it's not this year, but I'm planting the seed as food for thought. 
how do we make this easy for you to do community parties? Um, what, what process do I need to put in place to make it easier? Because we do informal block parties down in Old Town because we have a lot of dead end streets. And so just talk to everybody and don't even put up a barrier or do anything. And then next thing you know, someone's got a fire pit in the middle of the street. And I'm like, no, don't do that. <laughs> but it's fun. Like, it's fun to be out there. And, and it, it's a very multi-generational thing. It appeals to the kids. It appeals to the adults. It appeals to the seniors who've watched the houses turn over two or three times. So anyway, food for thought. We got to get there. We have to make it easier. Um, I don't know that this summer is the summer that it will happen, but. Let's have another neighborhood. I can go for our neighborhood. In general, this is Mary Lynch. Hi, Mary. Um, one of the things that I've really missed is the food bank. <laughs> and I, everybody I talk to has missed it on two accounts. Those that really need the food bank, not only from the food, but also from the clothes and other things. And those of us that would maybe don't have a bunch of money, but I have a bunch of things that I could contribute that yep. Value yep. Village won't take. Yep. Uh, Goodwill's not here locally. So, you know, we really need to see how we can get the food bank back open for those ends. Because the other thing I've seen, I'll be very honest with Value Village, I have taken stuff over there and I went in there just a couple of times and they don't have what they used to have in there. They're taking most of our donations and shipping it elsewhere. And that's my concern. And they've raised their prices. Well, I'm so we, we need more things where we can keep it in the community. And it's not, I've tried the online Facebook stuff where you give it away. And that's just not a really good, efficient way to do it when you've got a big yeah. bag of clothes and all. So we've got to find out how in this pandemic we get that back open. Okay, so I'm going to give Autumn a to-do on that one, Mary, and that is that um, when we were trying to get Cougar Mountain Zoo open, um, the general rules from the state were prohibiting pushed back. Um, we were able to get them to allow the zoo to open um, with appropriate provisions. Uh, sooner than say Woodland Park Zoo could. So maybe it's time for my legislative team to work with the governor's office and ask those questions again about how do we get donations? What is it that we need to do to be able to get people to be able to do donations? Because the Food and Clothing Bank is, um, I think our best way of giving back. Oh goodness, right. Connie's got a lot of stuff she wants. <laughs> yeah, well, and the thing is you've got a lot of, you know, the lower level, income people that are just having yeah. all sorts of problems and they don't yeah. necessarily know how to go and get it, but the food bank is one way. Yes. So. I mean, the food bank can be a super hub, but I'm not sure if this community is aware, I'll just do a two, two minute little update. Um, we are hoping that Eastside Fire and Rescue, the city and the food bank can have a improved expanded service center at the current Eastside Fire and Rescue headquarters site. Um, because of COVID, the fire chief has determined that they do not need to build a separate building for the administration, that they can actually take less space and is currently working with Food Bank and with Senator Mullet for some seed money to be able to have the fire headquarters, um, the clothing bank, the food bank, community rooms, potentially hygiene station, laundry, whatever, um, just creating that on Newport Way at that location. And uh, so far, I think the interim step they've been able to do is I do believe that the clothing bank is open right now and it's at Newport Way. Um, but it's quite a fractured system right now and everything is quite limited. Um, uh, many of the things that Corey is taking in are only new not yeah used. that's my that's my concern yeah. that yeah. doesn't help it's right. all going all the old um right so, so that, um autumn and that I needs to get out what we are doing you know yeah. to the community that needs it and yeah. i haven't seen that on next door or any place. okay so. okay good to know and then autumn um let uh can you remind me to work with jen on, on approaching the governor and approaching our legislators again to um 
dig in deeper on uh, when, how soon can we actually resume um, donations again? The science is showing us that um, surfaces like clothing and everything are not great sources of transmission. And so we may need to push the envelope on this a little bit. Well, even the science says if you let it set for 72 hours, you're okay. Yep. <laughs> That's what I do with my kids. I have yeah. something for you. It's in the garage. Come over in three days. <laughs> That's the first thing. The other thing is I've been really, because of COVID, we've really been, our community left out of the loop on what's happening with the projects over here. And my okay. concern is we have a lot of projects that are wrapping up, the bonds are being lifted, and I would like to have a walkthrough of this area with whoever is responsible, because we've got a lot of loose ends that need to be tied up. We also have a lot of things that haven't been committed. Case in point is we were promised that we would have a trail on the south side of Newport Way from Oakcrest to the new trailhead. Mm -hmm. What we ended up after they did the culvert project and then they widened the street last fall is for us to get to the, for any of us to get to the um, new trailhead is we have to go out into the bicycle lane. So that means our backs are to cars that are already traveling in the bicycle lane. And on top of it, now with the new curb there and the parking area closed, we can get up to 20 cars a weekend with cars parking on Oakcrest and they're walking yep. with families. They're not new to the area or they're new to the area. Yep. Last week, I saw 10 people that pulled up in two cars and walked down and walked in Newport Way with their backs to the traffic to get to the trailhead. Yeah, Mary, um, I'll get you to work with Autumn. I am not sure what the schedule of neighborhood meetings is this year, but um, the sooner we do the Newport one as we enter the spring, because it is the busy construction season, the better. So um, we'll do that. And any other issues than what you brought up right now, maybe well, if you want to pull around the neighborhood, it'd be good to send them in ahead. So okay. that meeting might feel a little different than, say, my meeting with South Cove, where there are no projects going on. Well, the overall thing, we need to know about complete streets. Because yeah. this was, we brought it up with both design services and with operations. And this yeah. is what we've got. This yeah. never should have happened. We've spent millions of dollars on both of these, and we've ended up with an incomplete street. Yep. And I don't know how you're going to be able to fix it in the near future. Yeah, so we'll make, so if you can pull, um, Autumn can send you back the questions that we heard tonight. And if you can pull your neighborhood and get more, because I'm sure there's more that they would add to the list, then we'll plan that neighborhood meeting. That's the other issue is I don't have access to Reva or to Anthology, really, um, and their contacts. And Autumn says she has that. So I okay. need to know how I can act because they need to be in on this conversation too. Because the other issue we have is the speeding around their cul-de-sac and there's going to be some major accidents that there haven't already been with that cul-de-sac and people speeding around that at the entrance yeah. of the ecology. It sounds similar to what we do with Talos when we do our Talos community meeting because there is a building going on up there in uh -huh. several different places is that the meeting is different like it is a neighborhood meeting, but there are staff there, there are developers there, so we'll do that. Well, and we need to reach out to those areas so they, they're there at the meeting. I don't want to be yeah. the only one, because I, I don't, you know, I say hi to them when they're walking the dogs, but because of COVID, their meeting or their 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 people in their offices aren't even there. Yep. So I don't know who to contact there. Yeah, they're not in their offices. Yep. Right. All right. Okay. Yeah, Thanks, thank Mary. You. Hi. Thank you. Good, e good evening, Mayor. Um, I just wanted to follow up here on Mary Lynch's comments. I did contact the city regarding the unfinished trail along Newport Way from Oakcrest to the trailhead. And this, uh, the city response was that Reva is not in charge of that section because it's the culvert project that it has to go around that, that bridge to be built. And that is a city project. And they're not sure when they'll be able to get that done and i did raise the concerns that pedestrians are walking onto moving uh, you know onto the travel lane to get through that culvert area so that's Great. still an outstanding do you know item. who um um uh, hart do you know who you were talking to ryan sweet 
Okay, thanks. Um, and then since I'm on right now on the air, um, we all have experienced uh, increase in package theft or porch mm -hmm. pirates and also car prowling in various neighborhoods, which is um, something that we're all having to, to deal with and come up with ways to secure our neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. um, regarding um, our neighborhood, Summerhill has 55 homes. I have uh, email address for all the homeowners, but I only get about 50% uh, response on the emails. And when we have our annual meeting, we only get a handful of people actually show up. And during this time of COVID, many people are staying indoors and, and away from each other. So we're not mm -hmm. having as much contact with one another. And also within the city, the limited number of uh, electronic reader boards in the city, we don't go out as much from our homes. We're trying to stay in as much as possible. So we're not getting to see those few electronic messages. And uh, last I want to bring up is Comcast. I don't know what <laughs> the city has any control over Comcast, but I just want to share with you my recent experience. My contract expired a couple of days ago. My telephone, my sorry, my television TV bill was $100 on the previous contract. The new contract started now this week and the price is $125. So that's a 25% increase. And I don't know of any uh, utility or grocery bill or any other charges that have gone up significantly as 25%. And then on the internet side of things with Comcast, they now have a limit on the data. So every month you're entitled to so many gigabytes of data. And if you exceed it, there's a charge. Well, we're all staying at home. We're working from home. Oh, yeah. Uh, multiple multiple people at home. We have to use uh, to do our jobs or, or to communicate and, and entertain ourselves. So I think Comcast is really uh, taking advantage of the situation. And I don't know what the city can do over those kind of uh, utility charges. So out of my wheelhouse it's not my utility there's a couple of couple of things going on here one is we could have more competition in town if uh, another uh, comcast competitor wanted to build infrastructure here that is the big hurdle is that many of them don't want to unless it's a brand new community like the highlands or talus where you have the opportunity to get in the ground early uh, you can pick a fiber optic provider or you can have competition. But in the rest of the city, um, uh, Autumn and her team have been working on this for a long time. We have a cable commission, is how do you get competition so that somebody like Comcast doesn't do that? There aren't any interested competitors that want to make that investment in Issaquah's infrastructure. Um, as far as the rates go, that is something we can um, look into and get back to you. It's not anything that's under our control, but in my utility world and the other utilities, um, we have limits that are regulatory limits that we can only, you know, increase up to a certain amount. I don't know how it works in Comcast world. Um, I do know there's an enormous amount of dissatisfaction, not only about the rate increases, but the services, the payment for premium services, but then measuring and finding out that you're not even getting that level of service and you will not get a rebate for your premium service. So um, if they are regulated at a different level, um, and t t tell me if I'm wrong on this, Autumn, is it the um, FCC that regulates them and they're the ones who hold the hammer? And we, yes. have, we have had some residents who are so annoyed yes. that they've actually gone up the chain of command in the FCC and it's produced more dialogue with Comcast, but not necessarily change. It hasn't brought answers to questions of, you should give me my money back if I'm paying for a service that you can't provide or the outages are so significant and, and they're happening at the time of day my kids are learning and all of that. So they're the regulatory body, but they're so far removed from us. Um, but we'll have our um, communication staff look into this rate thing and see. It may be that they have the freedom to do whatever they want. I mean, my husband read me a headline from a story today that talked about um, those that are actually making money 
during this crisis and how much money they're making yeah. and who's got a lever or uh, something to control it. And unfortunately, there are people that are making money and there are rates going up. I know our utilities team worked really, really hard not to do a utility rate increase this year because it's just, it's not, we could figure out a way to do it. It was, you know, so, but um, we have a representative who lives in town, who is the community um, customer service representative. Uh, Autumn and I have had meetings with her about issues on Squawk Mountain. Um, you need to tell the community what you're doing. You need to tell them when it's going to be done. You need to tell them. And we've gotten mediocre response, but um, so far, I think if they did a satisfaction poll in Issaquah right now, the numbers would be absolutely dismal. Yeah. And, and Mayor Polly, just to add on to, we are a regulatory, we do have some regulatory authority over cable service. So that we, we do have a franchise agreement with Comcast for. So if you have cable issues, we do want to hear about that so we can help advocate for you. So um, we'll follow up with you, Hart, because I think okay. it would be interesting to look more at the fee increase. Um, so I'll connect with you afterward. That's good. And then one, one other item just thought of on Newport Way, where we had that mudslide um, near that trailhead um, last year. But recently, there's an additional little mudslide to the, or landslide to the west of that location, and they put up the cement barriers on the roadway. So I'm hoping that at some point they'll do some major reinforcement of that area, and it's probably part of the trailhead project, you know, with the new yeah. parking yeah. and nope. all that. No, not part of the trailhead. I can give you okay. some more information on that. So the slide occurred on King County's property and um, they had slides everywhere last year. So our slide is in a list of slides to be repaired. Um, the concern for us is that it impinges on the road. That's not a concern for them. That's my concern. So um, my staff went to Washington State and has secured emergency funds to um, secure to build a wall to push back the slide so that the road can be fully reopened, but the design of the wall has to match whatever the future Newport Way design is. Um, I've reached out to King County Council members um, whose staff will not pay for it. Um, so we're sort of going out on a limb and doing it because it needs to be done. So I'm putting some political pressure on King County that um, they need to be paying for it. And if there's a component of it that gets built that is a, an element of a project we would have done anyway, that should be our share. But right now, um, we have a road with no shoulder and um, soil that's still slopped all over the place. So it's Correct. not part of a project. It's a problem. It's yeah. separate from a project. Thank, thank you. Uh, yeah. You're up again. Colleen. Colleen, thanks. Um, real quickly, I know there's a lot of talk right now about rezoning for the new, um, what is it, the middle middle school or the junior high that's being put on, built near Talis. And I was wondering if there was any talk right now, because they're talking with the rezoning, possibly putting Squawk Mountain residents. Oh, you uh, mean redistricting? Like schools? School Sorry, district redistricting. Redistricting. Sorry. Yeah. Yep. Um, and my kid's going to be in kindergarten next year, so I'm not quite part of the conversation, but will there be any trails to connect Squawk Mountain students oh, great to that new uh, school? Because right now, like, it's less than a mile probably as the crow flies yeah. to yeah. get, but there's no path, so it would yeah. be at least a two-mile walk. And I know it's an age where kids should be trusted to walk by themselves in a safe um, on a safe trail. Yeah, I, as a mom of a kindergarten, of a middle schooler, I wouldn't have my kids walk down State Route 900 to school, yeah. though. Not that I think it's dangerous. It's just that, you know, no. yeah. who puts sidewalks on state routes? That's just whatever. Yeah. Um, someday is the answer. Okay. The city is working with the developer across the street from Talis, who will be building within the next couple of years and has acquired some easements that would uh -huh. um, have a trail from the Talos neighborhood, cross SR 900 and cross Tibbetts Creek. 
and we're getting a few little pieces along Tibbetts Creek. Um, and Connie, you might remember the name of that corridor. Is it the Squawk Valley Corridor Trail that's supposed to go in there? Uh, yeah, I don't think it has a terrific name, but there is a more near-term near solution with the Tibbetts Valley Master Plan uh, yeah. because there is potential to take a trail across, just across the street through that place where they're cutting down all the blackberries and in theory have slated a dog park, though it's not for sure. So if it doesn't become a dog park, then you could connect a trail through that park and very easily go across the bottom of Tibbetts Valley Park yeah. and and out to SR 900. Uh, I mean, you would want to walk that, of course, with your kid and your dog. Mm -hmm. uh, because oh, then it would be a track and you would have your daily outing. But I yeah. think that's the most expeditious route to a trail pathway. And um, I, I would vote for an interim trail in there, but that uh, planning is coming up in the third quarter of this year. So if you keep your eye open for the Tibbetts Valley Master Plan. Now, one, this this sort of leads me to a, how do people in the woods know that the Tibbetts Valley Master Plan is coming up so that they would pay attention? Because there's really no way to to notify the Homeowners Association of nearby things like master plan planning. And that'd be a great link up to try to figure out. Yeah, if you email me, uh, yeah. yeah, I can bring it up at our next meeting to do an email blast to the neighborhood because and then same with Inniswood. Um yeah. that would be hugely yes. nice. So is there a concern about uh redistrict redistricting from the point of view of not wanting to have kids go to different schools or just curiosity about who um, might be going I, to that school and who might be going to another one? I can't speak on that. Um my kid is gonna be in kindergarten next year, so I don't know what all the parent I don't have kids of age yet where like they're um, I'm around those moms that are talking about it right now. Mm -hmm. um, I, like the only the couple I have talked to, they don't they seem to not mind going to that school um, as a middle school. I think the big question was whether or not we were going to get rezoned for high school. Um, and that one didn't seem as it just didn't seem like a realistic solution because on Squawk, you'd have to go down all the way down the mountain past Tibbetts and then get back onto 900. Mm -hmm. And the, just like the nightmare that is during traffic hour, mm -hmm. I just don't think that's a realistic high school commute. Um, mm -hmm. Cause it could be like, I don't know what, 15 minutes to Newport. I think that was the debate whether it was gonna be Issaquah High School or Newport. Um, oh, I just don't think that's a realistic commute for any high schooler um, to deal so, with. Um, we do not have a, a, a voice at the table on the redistrict, redistricting, but um, yeah. Newport isn't even in Issaquah House High School District. So what we mm -hmm. can do is Autumn can send you a link that you can share on whatever form it is they're talking about, about what the redistricting might compose of. Okay. What I know is that the middle school has likely got another 12 months until um, it's open. And mm -hmm. then the next projects are, there's an elementary school that you can see being constructed up on the Sammamish Plateau, just inside Sammamish on Issaquah Pine Lake Road. And then there's another property up uh, 43rd that um, is proposed for two schools. And so I think the, the theory about it's like a middle school that I've heard, and again, I'm not a school district person, is that many of the students will be coming from the rural areas south of town to populate that school, that the shortage is in providing space for students who don't live within a city because the Growth Management Act doesn't allow schools to build new schools outside of cities. And so there'll be some you know, middle schoolers from Mississauga, but probably two thirds will be coming from unincorporated Renton, uh, unincorporated mm. Newcastle. That's interesting. My, my guess, I guess. Yeah. Well, yeah. Colleen, right now they are talking about that. So you need to go to the district's webpage and they are actively having meetings yep. on that. And so now's the time to do it because yep. once those schools get built, it's too late. They've mm -hmm. already yep. made their minds up. So. Okay. Awesome. Yeah, but I had one thing with 
what she brought up is I really think because of everybody out walking, it really would be nice to get out more of a plan on conductivity and how do you get around out um, Issaquah maps and that because yeah. mm -hmm. there's you know, a lot of people are new to Issaquah and we need to point them towards the routes that they really should be going on. And there's nothing mm -hmm. on the website or anything like that. And we need to work on getting something like that out and making mm -hmm. sure in the future we do have connectivity. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So is there any neighborhood rep who hasn't had a chance to talk about a particular neighborhood or have we covered uh, Overdale? I know we have, at least I haven't heard very much from Overdale. Um, any others that are on tonight that want to share ideas or thoughts? I have, this is Susan from Newport. Hi Susan. I have one comment I wanted to make. Um, I, I, I believe that the fact we're trying to make connections between neighbors and neighborhoods and city. Um, one of the things, and this is, <clears throat> might be too personal, but when I attend a city council meeting or even a board meeting, that we're not, the residents aren't representative in photos. We're mm -hmm. call-ins and to me, it feels cold. Mm -hmm. I feel left out, so. <laughs> yeah, we're working on that with uh, our technology provider or we might be just switching technologies. Okay, I wasn't sure if it was an unnecessary cost or, cause I know, you know, the budgets are tight and. No, it's, I, yeah, sorry, um, Adam, go ahead. Oh, sorry, I was just going to say, I, I have an update too, just because I work so um, closely with IT and clerks. Uh, we're working on it, and we hope to have a solution very soon. Okay. Um, that is, that's an upgrade of the current WebEx platform. And from the mayor's point of view, it's not a money thing. Um, I was driven by security concerns based on the hacks that happened in other places, and um, so I put security, um, Security is the number one thing while we were using the tool, but now we're finding out that some of the tools are changing to add more functionality, which is good. But also if uh, the one we're using right now can't add the functionality, the IT world uh, moves at 10 times the speed of the ref. There will be a tool out there that we can use that will provide the security that we need. Okay, I appreciate that. <clears throat> and maybe just letting people know that would be good too. That yeah, I don't think IT's made a decision yet, so I don't think we have information to share okay. on a rollout date, but they are working on it. Just Soon, yep. on it makes me feel good. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, um, other neighborhoods, we're getting near the end. I just wanna make sure if there's anybody else who wants to share ideas or ask questions of any of the other neighborhood champions. I mean, there's a lot of different things going on in different places. And for me as mayor, it's super helpful. I tell people um, there's something for everybody in Issaquah because we have every kind of neighborhood you can think of, ones that are extremely structured, ones that have no structure, ones that the houses are buried in the trees, the other ones that share common spaces in front of them. I mean, the uh, uh, some on the waterfront, some with views. I mean, it's there's just everything. And so, um, oh, sorry, go ahead, Colleen. Oh, my question that if anyone had any ideas, um, so one problem we have in our neighborhood is our CCNRs right now. Um, we currently have like, technically five different divisions within our neighborhood that all have different rules. Um, and they can just vary everything from like what size fence you have and things like that. But does anyone have any um, experience trying to merge CCNRs um, or try to like make it a more comprehensive uh, set of rules to follow? I don't know if it, like the Highlands has anything like this. Colleen, is that... Um... Inniswood, Morgan's Ridge, and not no, no, not Inniswood. It's really weird. Um, so like the woods, I think has like technically three different rules. So it just depends on when they were built. Oh. Um. Oh. So that there's something like Division One A, Two A. Um. So just between Morgan's Ridge and the woods, there's like five sets of rules. Um. Maybe. Um. I'll let Christy. Christy, I'll get to you in one second. Um. What. Depending on how Christie's organization has dealt with it, um, we may be able to just get a legal question as well to get 
some advice that says um, this is how you do those things. But anyway, Christy, go ahead. Well, Colleen, I was just going to say Sarah Hoy was on the call, and she's the executive director for the Esquire Highlands Community Association. I think she's dropped off. Okay. Um, but uh, you can, um, uh, if you go to IsquaHighlands.com, you'll you, you can find all of our staff's contact information. In Isqua okay. Highlands, all the neighborhoods. Um, I mean, we have an overriding um, HOA and, and uh, CCNRs, and then there are supplemental neighborhoods that have oh. tweaks to that. So, um, so I know she would be very, she's very expert in okay. how to navigate that and would be a great resource for you. Okay. Awesome. Sarah, Sarah that is, Hoy, yeah. H-O-E-Y. And so Colleen, I'll question. send you a, a recap email with her yeah. info. Yeah, Thank that you. and bunny ideas. <laughs> and so if that works, Colleen, that's great. Um, and if you need um, additional assistance, we may be able to just, you know, talk with um, our lawyer to find out um, what the, I'd hate the answer to be. It's so complicated. You need to hire a lawyer to do it. Hopefully what Sarah it's, has. <laughs> it, it might involve a lawyer. So it's just. <laughs> It'll involve more. We want to make it like one set of rules. Yeah. You know, because we only have 200 houses. Yeah. And so five sets of rules with 200 houses is just not. Yeah. Because we're getting into more neighbor disputes over certain things. Mm. And yeah, one chunk of houses has to follow this. And yeah. So, we're, yeah, we've been getting a lot of that. Well, guys, I think wait, wait. it's. Let me. I just want to say something to my Newport Way people. You know the vets, the v Triangle Vet property. They're looking at putting a hundred units in there. It's in pre-app, so you're going to want to check that out. Uh, it's because a hundred units vet. there is. Did that go that, through? Did that, that go through? Has, you know what? We will add that to the list of stuff for the Newport Way meeting. Um, I don't know where that is in the process. Pre-app. It's in pre-application, not a complete application yet. At right. least from what I can see from our active projects list, which right. you guys know that there is such a thing as an active projects list, so you can track new development on the on the website. Though um, it has a a poor interface with public projects, so we need to improve that interface. For example, the new washout property where they want to be. Uh, putting a pump station and then a potential future water tower is has not been updated in quite some time. So I'm not exactly sure um, how to keep everything accurate in COVID time or who to torture because Keith Niven is gone and we have Andrea Snyder is the acting community development and whatever it's called person, right, Mary Lou? So yeah, Andrea's in, we're in interviews on February 11th for a new um, com community planning and development director. Yeah. yeah, I just looked that up on the active list. Uh, Connie, thank you for bringing that to my attention. It's called Milano Issaquah Apartments. Great. So, Thank you guys for coming tonight and sharing your thoughts and your stories and your ideas. I think um, when we meet quarterly, I'll have a COVID update that will not be as long as what we went through tonight <laughs> so that you can spend more time talking with each other, which I think is really good and helpful. And Autumn is going to send up some follow-up notes with links or emails or any of those requests that you all had this evening. So thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. See ya.